Today, it's a conversation on commercial lifestyle photography on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. This is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by trying to take a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. This show, as with every show, you'll find the show notes at behindtheshot.tv. And of course, you can also find me. I'm on, uh, let's see, Twitter and Instagram and Mastodon. It's at Steve Brazel for me personally or Behind the Shot TV at Behind the Shot TV for the podcast. It's only me on Mastodon, though, but you should check out Mastodon. It's been a lot of fun so far that I've been there. Uh, oh, one other thing the podcast is available in an audio only format or a video format. Wherever you get your podcasts, that is assuming your podcast outlet of choice supports video like Apple Podcast does. If it does not, you can always head up to the YouTube channel on the YouTube channel. I've got most of the show notes there down below the like and subscribe button, at least all of the links that we talk about during a show. And that brings me to my guest today. And the guest today this time around uh, is a photographer and filmmaker based in Hanoi, Vietnam, Tim Gerard Barker. Tim, how are you, buddy? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Dave. It's nice to have you here. Thanks so much for doing this. And and what time is it for you? It's seven o'clock my time. Is it 10 a.m. your time? 10 a.m. Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to start right into the Hanoi thing because uh -huh. clearly you're not born and raised, I'm guessing, in Hanoi. <laughs> um, you've been, I, I read up on you a ton and here's what I've learned. You've been based out of Hanoi since 2012, but it, it looks as though you left at some point and then returned in 2021 is that right yeah so i uh i spent the first four years in hanoi and then i moved down to ho chi minh city and i spent four and a half years down there but um my wife is actually from hanoi so she wanted to return to hanoi uh oh that was just over a year ago i guess a year and a half ago so we're back here now and where are you originally from i'm from melbourne australia okay so you know, you're not as far away from Hanoi as I am, for example. No. Uh, I have a number of people, Jeff Cable, I think it was, just did a uh, a workshop in Vietnam. And then Frederick Van Johnson, I know, has been to Vietnam a couple of times. And everybody I know that goes to Vietnam loves visiting Vietnam. W what's interesting to me is when, when I look through your site, knowing, you know, where your base of operation is, the the photographic categories on your site are pretty vast. I mean, you have a lot of different categories compared to most photographers that I know. Hospitality, hotels, and resorts. Uh, by the way, folks, we're not touching on that today, but I just have to say, go look at that category in, in his website because, wow. Uh, lifestyle, travel, corporate, industrial, portraiture, landscape and aerial, NGO, and documentary. You, you're, you're fairly well-skilled here. If you had to pick one of those, is there a favorite? Ah, uh, look, I I think I, I moved here because I love, you know, I, I'm a I'm a traveler by heart. So I love being, I love being on the road. I love being on assignment in an interesting place. So um, documentary style shooting is probably what I enjoy most when it's it's unscripted and I'm I'm discovering a new place. Like um, getting up early, you know. First light, last light. That's that's my favorite thing to do. But um, it's not always what pays the bills. So uh, so yeah, I, I I do a few other things as well. You sound like a music photographer. We music <laughs> photographers. There's no, there's not a live music photographer that I know that doesn't also do something else to help pay the bills. You have. Um, I'm looking at your website, right? You, your award list is rather extensive as well. And you've worked with some of the biggest companies anybody could work with, Nike, Forbes, Novartis, uh, Discovery Channel, CNN, BBC, you know, and, and a lot of other ones. But looking through all of your client base, looking through all of your categories, I always try and find a common thread in people's work. Because mm -hmm. I think in some way that that photographic vision, that photographic eye that we have manifests itself in whatever we're shooting, right? There's something, it's kind of like a, you know, an actor. There's a little uh -huh. piece of every actor in uh, the real actor in every role that they play. And I, I think there's a little piece of us 
in the work that we do. And there's one thing to me that stands out in your work. The ability for you to work in the field with real people in real places and the shot that actually we're going to talk about today is a perfect example of this, but you have an ability to structure a scene for a client as though better than most people, you understand where the goals of that client and the craft of photography meet. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think so. Like I, I envisage myself as a photographer who, yeah, it's those real moments that I feel like I'm good at capturing um, and trying to make them as believable as possible, whether I'm, you know, working with models, working with um, lighting, working in unfavorable conditions. I'm just trying to capture, you know, ideally believable images um, and capture I don't like to direct too much when I'm working with talent I like to try and capture something real within that moment so you know I'll tend to put my talent in a place and get them to try and almost be themselves like I don't like to tell them exactly what to do so and that way I feel like I can construct a more realistic moment okay but, oh, all right, man, I got things going on in my head here. You don't like to direct too much, but you manage to get facial expressions and mannerisms out of people. Are you telling me those aren't coached and posed or or they are to a point? Because I, I guess what I'm asking is, what is your key to making a client's often over-the-top vision become a reality? Because you do it. And it I, I mean, this the shot we're going to talk about today, I believe this scene happened. I, it's almost like street photography to me. And I know it's not. Well, I, I, I guess um, one of the reasons that shot came about was because of a street photo. So, um, and I'm not sure if I'm jumping ahead too much, but I went to this location uh, in advance. The client had an idea that that we were going to shoot at this particular location. And um, I went there a few weeks in advance uh, to try and work out which, which exact location I would shoot at. But it was actually a photo that I took um, of the owners of uh, this cafe that I ended up shooting at, um, which I then replicated for the final commercial image. Um, and I, you know, I used the same lens. I used the pretty much the exact same composition. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it was that street photograph which I, I captured, and then I made that better by lighting okay. it. And that answers a lot on the shot I'm going to bring up in a minute. But, but let's go back to that original concept, and that is, you do have this ability to assemble something for clients in a way that I don't often see. So when when these clients, these large clients, come to you with these visions, and we know clients, right? If it, if if the number list goes to ten, they clearly want fifteen every time. <laughs> how do you how do you assemble these scenes so well? What is the key to making that vision come to life? I guess for me, it's preparation is uh, is everything. Like I I like to be. I like to be really well prepared. And um, so, you know, for this particular shoot, there was a lot of scouting involved. And yeah, it was, it was, it's, that's not always possible because I'm not, I'm sometimes shooting in a location that I don't live in. But, but uh, the client in this case was happy to shoot in Hanoi. Um, you know, when they first came to me, they wanted to shoot in, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And, the floating markets in a place called Canto, which is in the Mekong Delta. Um, but once they realized that I was living in Hanoi, uh, we, they quickly decided to, to change the location to Hanoi and we worked out um, locations that would be suitable. And, and, you know, it was an important shoot to me because there was a lot of crea creativity involved. Uh, look, I was, it was, I guess I was just having, I knew I was going to be able to make some great images with this shoot. Um, so I was willing to put in a bit of extra time. And um, a lot of these locations were, you know, 15, 20 minutes away from where I live. So 
um, I, you know, I did put in extra time and, and got some great images from there. So I want to bring up this shot, but I, I, I want to specify ahead of time that there is a blog post that you wrote about this shot. And I, I'm going to point people to that, but I, I just want to get it out early that the link to that is in the show notes. And of course, the you know image itself, you can go to the blog post at behindtheshot.tv, all the, the links and everything are in that blog post. A little bit that I wrote about uh, Tim as well. And then also there's a small gallery of his work that you can look at, but your best bet again is just to, to head on over to his website. So for this image, I'm looking through the metadata and most of the metadata was stripped, but I did notice the caption that you had. And the caption you have for this is Western entrepreneur and Vietnamese businessman chat business at a Hanoi train station or Hanoi uh, train street coffee shop. And I can't think of a better description for this. I guess I have a, a separate question for you. Do you ever name your images? Uh, I name my images by, um, yeah, TGB slash the date slash the client slash the location usually. So, um, so you don't come up with creative names. It's more whatever the job is. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I've always been horrible at, you know, coming up with names for images. So yeah, uh, that's not something I'm, I'm good at. So for this image. The only EXIF data I could find was that the lens was a Sony FE50 1.4 ZA. What body was this shot with? Uh, it was shot on a Sony A7R3. Okay. And do you do, you've got, we'll get into lighting here in a minute, but do you do any certain autofocus mode or mode on the camera? Uh, I would, I would, for, like aperture so, priority or something or. So for this shot, I, for commercial shots, I usually like to work on a tripod. So, um, because I often do a bit of compositing, um, and, you know, as, as I mentioned, it was based on a, on a street photo, which I took handheld. But when I went back, I, I, I found that exact same composition uh, and then set up on a tripod. Um, and are you in manual and, mode here? Uh, yeah, shooting fully manual. Um, I probably just shot in single shot autofocus mode for this because there's no moving elements. Um, okay. I, yeah. And do you do you set your white balance or auto white balance? I always shoot it fifty six hundred. Um, uh, yeah. Five, sorry, five thousand six hundred. Okay. And last but not least, what was your exposure, shutter, aperture, ISO on this? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I checked. Uh, it was um, 1 15th of a second at F4 at ISO 1000. 1 15th of a second? Correct, yeah. Interesting. F4, okay, ISO 1000. So it's yeah, that, that explains the blur that we've got in this shot. And for those of you on the audio feed, I'll describe the shot for you in just a second so that you kind of have a picture in your head. But I want to start with this. Obviously, this was, we now know, based on that that first shot that you took, the street shot, which, again, if you go to behindtheshot.tv and find this episode, there is a link to a blog post that Tim wrote about this shot. And it's nice because you've got the street shot and the final shot on top of each other with a slider to go back and forth and see what you added and what you removed from the shot. But I want to start here. Why the 50 millimeter? In my head, a lot of street photographers prefer more around the 35 millimeter. You're on a full frame camera. Is there a reason that you tend to go with that 50? Uh, well, when I went to the location, I, I had a 35, I had a 50, I had a 85, um, and I played around with the different lenses, but this 50 enabled me to create that shape with the train tracks in a way that the, the 35 didn't, and, and neither did the 85, it, it was just about, it was just about putting on different lenses and working out what worked. Um, 
it, it also enabled the the people in the cafe to be, you know, at a at a reasonable size. Um, it, it was all about positioning. This shot was all about the shape of the tracks, firstly, which lead the eye through the shot. Um, I wanted to be able to see a little bit of the skylines because I was going to, you know, I knew that I wanted to shoot at dusk when the the lights of the cafe were were just coming on. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, 50, 50 is what worked, really. Like, I so don't, the th I'm not wedded to any particular lens, but I shoot okay. on fixed lenses. And here I, I see what you're saying. Those people are they're on really kind of the, they're facing right into the right lower third, but they're close enough to the edge that on a 35, they would have distorted. I'm assuming at least. Yeah. I, you know, for me, if it was a 35, it just would have been a much messier composition. There would have been, um, one to get them at that size, I would have been have to be closer and it wouldn't have been able to have the, the tracks, um, in the same position. Um, so either the tracks are in the same position and I'm seeing more of the sides, which were a bit messy. Um, uh, uh, and they would have been much smaller. So yeah, 50 is just what worked. Okay. And then you knew you wanted blur. Is that why you went with the slow shutter speed? Yeah, so I wanted the the motorbikes in the background to be a little bit blurred. I I shot some images at a faster sh faster shutter speeds when I first went to scout, and and when the motorbikes weren't blurred in the background, um, my eye went to them. Um, and it was also because I wanted some depth, so. You know, when I my actual the, the scouting shot I shot, I think I shot at f one point four, um, so the background was more out of focus. Um, but my client wanted some depth in the image, so I it was about it was about trying different shutter speeds and aperture com combinations to try and work out something that allowed me to get focus on them, but some depth in the background. Um, and yeah, F4, it, you know, it was going to be between a 15th and a, and a 30th, I think. Um, that was kind of the range that I tried to shoot at throughout the shoot. It's interesting because the depth of field here, and, and I can't say this about every image that I see, even though an image may really strongly work for me, but the depth of field here is spot on for what I what I envision I would feel standing there. The the people being sharp, the the cross street in the background being recognizable and yet having motion blur in it. Um, I wanna I wanna describe this shot for those of you that are on the audio feed, but before I do, you describe the goal of this scene in this blog post in a really cool way. Too well dressed but artistic financial entrepreneurs in their 30s to 50s enjoy coffee in Hanoi's Old Quarter Train Street. It's dusk, and the light of an iPad reflects into one of the subject's faces. We see hints of Vietnam, the low tables and chairs, a motorbike, passerby. Was that the client's description? Or was that a collaborative yeah, that was, idea that, that you guys came up with? That was the client's brief for the shot, and it, it did change in the end. It wasn't it wasn't an iPad, and it ended up being a um, a laptop. Um, and you know, in Vietnam, Vietnam's known for these low tables, but uh, which which uh, kind of end up at around your knees, um, which you know a lot of street food places have them, and people eat at them. This cafe has them as well, but we ended up swapping out the low tables for this you know, slightly nicer uh, table, which was this, uh, basically this cafe has two sections, one on this side of the tracks and one on the other side of the tracks, and they had different tables. So we swapped out the, the nicer table. Well, and here's the thing though, I still think the table's the right height, 
because if it had been some bigger table, it would block them, but it barely crosses mid belly on them. So you, you see them, their hands are in front of them, but free. Let me, let me explain this for those of you on the, on the audio feed. Uh, and by the way, I had a comment on Twitter on a recent show that while I was describing it, the image was not full screen. I tend to start with it on full screen and then go to this view that I'm in right now, because some people like to see facial expressions and stuff when I talk, but you can always keep in mind, go to the website behind the shot.tv and see this image on its own if you want to. But let's, let's run through this really quick. It's a landscape orientation. This is going to be a long description because there is a lot happening here. A landscape orientation image, and the colors are really rich and vibrant, which I would expect in, in this type of a scene in Vietnam. You're on a train track, and when I say you are on a train track, and by the way, in an alley, or at least it feels like a, a small, narrow, curved alley. When I say you're on a train track, there is a train track that enters the frame at the bottom left-hand corner. And it curves up to mid frame a little farther from the edge. And so based on that perspective, you can tell that you're like standing in the train track here, or maybe you're on the other side, but the framing of it, hard to say, but the feeling for the viewer is you're on the train track. It enters, like I say, bottom left, goes up to the, the, the left third, slightly curving up and then out of the frame, mid frame in a distant scene of the, the alley. Okay. At midpoint is a street crossing with a bunch of what we'd call in the States mopeds, but you know, small motorbikes. And some of them are blurred in motion crossing the street. Now, what's interesting is you just mentioned the cafe has stuff on both sides of the track. You can't see where we're standing, the buildings to the left of the track. You can only see the buildings to the right until you get to that cross street at mid frame. And then as this, the frame disappears and moves to the top, you can see both sides there. And that clearly gives you an idea that there are buildings on your left where you are and you don't need to see them. On the right side is a small pullout. I don't want to call it a porch. It's only one step up, but an area with some seating and a table. But in front of that, right next to the train track is what I'm going to call a sidewalk. It's a small two square paver. Rare, I'm not talking small pavers like a driveway paver, but rather large square tiles that go up and out of the frame. And right by you is a moped leaving where you're at. And that is exactly at the lower third of the image. Again, on the right, buildings lining the track. Some of those buildings are lit up with lights. Some of them clearly have doors open with lights like coming out. Some of them, doors are closed, right? But there are colorful flowers and lamps hanging above this little porch area that the guys are on. And at the lower right third, really kind of between the lower right third and the right side of the frame are two men facing into the middle towards that lower right third. They're sitting at a wooden bench, or it could be two chairs, I can't tell, but I'm thinking it's a bench with multicolored horizontal striped fabric in front of them a small round metal legged table. There's a laptop that's open. Looks like a MacBook Air, uh, but a laptop open on the table. There's two glass saucers with little spoons on them. And each guest is holding a coffee cup in their left hand. There's a wall behind them. They're backed right up against the wall on that wall. And actually, I think this partially makes the scene in, an, in kind of an odd way are a bunch of photos and posters. And right in the middle, these surround those posters. They surround a really interesting looking guitar. Of the two men, on the left-hand side is the Westerner. I'll call him an American man on the left. He's wearing a blue jacket, white checkered shirt, navy blue sweater. I'm sorry, a blue and white checkered shirt, not a jacket. A navy blue sweater, dark slacks, his sleeves are rolled up, and I love this, and I'm, I'm dying to know when we get to it if this was intentional. He's got a super nice watch on his left wrist, and that lets me know who he is. Like, there's an old saying, my grandfather used to say, you judge somebody by their watch and their shoes, and the watch here tells me something about him. On the right-hand side is an Asian man. He's got long hair that's in a ponytail, Steve could only wish. He's wearing brown shoes, 
khaki pants, white shirt, dark blue jacket. Again, he has the coffee cup too. I can see his shoes clearly. Brown uh, leather laptop bag underneath the bench, like tucked under, which makes me think, and it's right by his leg, makes me think the laptop is his. All in all, what makes this shot to me is the vibrancy that brings real life to it, the leading lines of the track, and the stunning composition. So well done composition. Did I miss anything that I should have seen? Yeah, I think you're pretty much spot on there. Um, yeah. Okay. So, well described image. Leading lines of the track bring you into the scene. But the lighting on the men holds you on the subjects. I, I need to dive into that because the men appear to be clearly lit from the light up above them with the colorful flowers above them, except that light is above them. And the guy on the left clearly has light on the side of his face. Now, down the alley, it's lit totally fine. I can see detail. I can see everything. I'm guessing the light on his face could be coming from the other side of the street. But let, let's just start on the overall. You show up at the scene. You've got these two guys there. As you are setting this up for the final shoot. Explain how you laid this out, right? And by the way, I should mention the, the bushes that are overhead also are to the left of the one guy. So they're almost like a frame within a frame. When you laid this out compositionally, what were you thinking? I guess, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, a lot of the thought was, um, I guess, you know, we, we go back to the, the street photo that I took, like that, that decided the initial, that decided the composition. Um, so a lot of those decisions were already kind of made and my client loved the image um, and wanted it exactly the same. So it was about going back and finding that exact spot. There were... And should I talk about lighting yet? Because that's, I guess that's. A we'll get into lighting in a minute. I want to, I want to unpack something you just said though, because the street photo, the street photo that this was based on, was still your shot. Yeah. So when you framed this look with the curve of the tracks, with the at that time the shop owners, the the cafe owners on the right, what is running through your head composition wise? I want to understand how you think composition. I was looking mainly at the, uh, you know, there are two things I'm looking at. I'm looking at the tracks and I'm looking at them. Um, the tracks were really important, like moving a centimeter left, right, back, forward, really changed the dynamic of the shot. And 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 so my tracks are what I'm really focused on. Um, and then... You know, I, I don't want to, I'm very careful about not cutting elements of the image. So the height of the image, I, I didn't want to slice through that light, for example, which is at the, the top of the image. So I'm, I'm trying to keep that in frame. I'm trying to also get as close to them as possible on the right hand side of frame without showing too much. So it's, it's, you know, I know where my subjects are going to be. That's 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 uh, clear from from the from the um, position of the cafe, and and it's about just trying to you know find that perfect position where everything looks good. But my my tracks and my edge of frame and my top of frame where the light is uh, are what's guiding me. There's. There's a symmetry between the guys in the track and the lighting, the way the track goes down and is lit compared to how the two gentlemen are lit. This is exactly what I love in lighting because, you know, like when, when we talk dodging and burning to people, why do you dodge and burn? You dodge and burn to try and draw the, the viewer's eye through the scene the way that you want. And what's interesting here is 
clearly the brightest spot in the object is where my eye goes, which is the two guys. But the lighting on the track draws me into the environment, right? This is an environmental portrait, a lifestyle portrait. The tracks are critical. If it was darker back there or not as sharp back there, it would lose me understanding the full scene that these guys were in because the way you did it, they feel so natural. And by the way, it does feel like light is coming from that laptop. In the blog post, you mentioned that this was not simple lighting. So let's let's talk lighting. What did you do to light this? So, uh, yeah, my my first thought was um, you know, for the, for this these sorts of situations where I've got subjects in the frame and I'm lighting them, I'll often put a, a large softbox in frame, light them, and then take it out and take shots without it there. Um, but that wasn't going to work in this situation because. Um, because of the changing light it does. So, so I wanted a, a light that I would be able to easily retouch. Um, and uh, in the end, you know, my assistant um, uh, came up with the idea to boom a light, uh, which was a, it was a bare light with a 20 degree honeycomb grid on it. Um, the, uh, I was on a C stand to the left of frame, and the C stand was just outside of shot. Uh, the it was the and then he came up with the idea to to um, to join two C stand arms together and place the light on the end of those two arms so that we could boom it into shot as much as possible. Um, and I used a extension head on the light so that the the on the end of the C stand was only the actual light, um, the honeycomb grid, and a gel, and the um, the body of the light, which was a Godox eighty six hundred Pro, um, was. Uh, at the base of the light, so it wasn't it wasn't causing it wasn't it wasn't very heavy. Um, so I guess the 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 light was positioned. I guess as you look through the trees, uh, there's a little gap in the trees, and I think the actual light was positioned about there. And I, you know, I positioned it directly across from them, but slightly to the left of them so the light came from behind them slightly um i always like to light my subjects with some backlight because it it uh creates contrast um so that was the main light and then uh just to the right of frame i had an 80 by 120 softbox it was gridded so as not to spill the light too much uh also had a half um CTO gel on it, um, and that was just filling in the shadows. Uh, so yeah, there was one other thing with this shot in that um, inside the cafe, directly behind the two subjects, um, behind the guitar. Uh, the initial when I when I took my initial shot, it was a there was a green cast coming through that window because of fluoro lighting inside. Um, and you know, these, uh, these cafes are, are basically the, the backs of people's houses. So there's, there's actually a family that live in there. I'm pretty sure it's the cafe owner's family who live in there. So they were having dinner around their table as we were shooting this. Um, and we couldn't just turn their lights off. Um, so we ended up putting a black cutter in front of their light and uh, so that it didn't hit this corner of the room uh, that the camera can see. And we bounced a, uh, a I bounced a Gerdox 8200 off the roof with a half CTO gel on it so that a warm, um, a warm light came through the window instead of this 
ugly green light, that fluorescent light that we originally had. I like that. See, that's thinking. Now, the the half CTO gel, is that because these overhead lights, you were trying to match those? Yeah, I was trying to match them. Or was it just the color you wanted? No, I wasn't exactly trying to match them because I find uh, at dusk that uh, like a full CTO is too much. Um, I wanted some warmth in the in the in the real lights that were were there, um, and the half CTO was to was to make them very similar to the to the existing lights, but but um, but it allows the the you know existing available tungsten lighting in the cafe to just be a little bit warmer than the the flashlight. So let's talk post-production because this is where I think this image really comes to life is some of the stuff that you did in post. And again, there's, there's some hints to this in the blog post that you do as well. But let's start with what you put in or took out of the shot because you do take a plate and you do give yourself the ability to remove or add things to the shot. What would you have added or removed from this photo? Initially, my my client wanted they were they really wanted a motorbike in this shot. They they, they felt that um, uh, a motorbike was really important, and we would have motorbikes passing in the background. But we positioned a Vespa just outside the cafe. Um, and we had it parked, had it parked there, um, but that was removed because uh, this motorbike just naturally drove through the shot, and I, I fired off a few frames as it as it went past, and um, it felt so much more real. It felt just felt like a more a better moment um, with just the one motorbike rather than. The parked motorbike and this motorbike passing. Um, obviously, remove the light that was in shot, uh, and uh, the other thing I changed the moment with the two subjects. Um, uh, One twenty fifth of a second for this. I think. Oh, all right. Let me check the exposure again. One fifteenth. At one fifteenth of a second, I did have a little bit of movement in the Western subject's hand. Um, And the other thing that happened is that, um, you know, earlier in the shoot, they had these small uh, coffee cups, which um, are very typical of Hanoi, Um, but they drank their coffees in the cafe and I asked them to get a new coffee and I didn't realise at the time, but it given them a bigger glass, which which to me didn't look as much like a Hanoian coffee cup um, or a typical Hanoian coffee cup. So I um, I was keen to use the earlier image where they had the smaller coffee cups. The lighting on them was very consistent throughout the whole shoot, so I was able to easily just drop them in from a, from a shot from 10 minutes earlier um, where it wasn't as dark. Um, but the lighting in the cafe was exactly the same. So the moving motorbike in the shot closer to the gentleman is so key to me. I In the blog post, you show the one that's parked. And the fact that it has tail lights and a headlight shining down the path helps. Plus, it ties where I'm at as the viewer into the cross street where the mopeds are out in front. It kind of It kind of really brings the entire scene together, but swapping out that moped and swapping out the guys to a different shot of the guys does introduce some other post-production problems because it's not just add or subtract. Obviously you processed these pictures. So would you have done all of your compositing and then done your overall image color grading and look, or did you, take the base plate, process that the way you wanted the scene, copy and match that into the one with the guy and the moving Vespa, 
and then composite. You see what I'm uh, saying? Because there's there's at least three shots in here. Do you process them individually and then composite, or do you composite and then process? So I always uh, build my layers on top of each other. They're at the bottom of the file, and then I have a grading file at the top with um, and a retouching uh, a retouching layer as well. So. Um, uh, that way that if I ever want to change anything at a later stage, uh, the grading is, is, is at the top and it's on a different layer and, uh, and I can swap things in and out quite easily without affecting the grading. What, what are your apps of choice? You're talking layers. I'm assuming you're a Photoshop guy. Photoshop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Photoshop uh, and Lightroom. Pro processing is there anything? Uh, so say that again. I'm sorry. I process images in Lightroom and then then composite them in Photoshop. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Is there anything we didn't talk about in this shot that people should know was changed, happened, lit? So anything that would help people better understand the making of this image? I guess you know one one interesting element is that uh, this actual location. Um, about three or four months after we shot this. So we shot this towards the end of uh, a major COVID lockdown in, in Vietnam where, you know, people still couldn't come. The tourists were, were still weren't allowed to come into Vietnam at this point. Um, before COVID, the COVID lockdowns, uh, this was a very popular tourist spot and it was known as Hanoi Train Street. And, um, but once tourists started coming in again, this became extraordinarily popular, I guess, you know, a top popular location so much so that it got crowded. And I think at one point a train had to come to an emergency stop because there were too many tourists. So they've closed this, uh, this section of the tracks and the cafes are no longer open. Um, and there's a security guard at the entrance to this area so that people can't come in anymore and, and take uh, photos in there. So we were quite lucky to be able to use this location um, because a few months later it was, it's uh, no longer accessible. So I want to switch gears. Let's do a speed round here. Uh, for the speed round, answer these as fast as you can. Whatever first pops into your head is a good way to uh, to think about it. What is your top lighting tip for working out in the field? Uh, preparation. Okay. Biggest photo mistake you've made or almost made? Oh, God, that's hard. Um... Uh, um, uh, deleting it, uh, formatting a memory card on a shoot. Really? I'm yeah. not the only one. Okay, good. <laughs> Favorite composition rule if you have one? Uh, I don't tend to go by composition rules. Like I just go with what works. I, I think I naturally position things in, in thirds and, and, or, you know, I, I naturally go for those typical compositions, but I don't, I don't think about them at the time I'm shooting. So, um, you know, if anything, it would be on a third, but, but it's not something I really think about. And this image that we were talking about today fits very well on thirds. It also fits on a golden spiral, which is interesting. What's your favorite source of inspiration? Hmm. Probably documentary photography. I, I, I just, um, yeah, I love, you know, I love beautiful documentary images that, that uh, emotionally... Um, content and whether that's going to exhibitions or, or uh, you know, world press photo. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I guess going to live exhibitions, going to um, photo festivals uh, is, uh, has been a big source of inspiration for me. 
What's your favorite band or performer? Uh, I'd say Radiohead. Ooh, good pick. I play them on the radio all the time. What's your favorite drink? Um, oh, it used to be craft beer, but I've become more of a cyclist recently, so I tend to drink more energy drinks than, than craft beers. Um, I'd still say craft beer is my favorite, though. <laughs> all right, works for me. And last but not least, is there any photographer that you think needs more attention that people should go follow? Uh, there's an Australian photographer named Andrew Quilty that uh, lived in Afghanistan uh, for most of the last 10 years. And um, I guess his work's probably quite well known, but I, yeah, he's my absolute favorite photographer. Um, his images capture real people in real places. And he's not, you know, his, war in, his work in Afghanistan was always at the side of the war. Capturing, um, capturing images that weren't necessarily about about um, uh, bombs and, and war and soldiers, but capturing you know people in Afghanistan and, and capturing stories around the edge of the war. And uh, yeah, I was really addicted to his work uh, in the lockdown last year, as Afghanistan was. Um, or as, as the U.S. were leaving Afghanistan. So, Okay. I will good. make sure that I put a link to that website, his Instagram, whatever, uh, in the show notes. And just a reminder to everybody, you can find the show notes for this show and every show. Just go to behindtheshot.tv, find whatever show it is you're looking for. And I write a little blog post about my guests, as I did you know, today with Tim. And then at the bottom... Any links that we mentioned, I try to include in there and also a small gallery of my guest work. And Tim, if people want to reach out to you, uh, what's your website? Uh, www.tgbarker.com. Okay. TimGerardBarker.com. So TGBarker.com, but for Tim Gerard Barker. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Vimeo are all Tim Gerard Barker. Uh, you're also on Facebook, but it's different. T.G. Barker Photography and Film, because you also do motion stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. What I'm, I'm curious, what percentage of your work is still versus video? Uh, for a while, it was 50-50, but uh, more recently, it's been more stills. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say it's probably 70-30 now. And a lot of the video assignments that I do are stills and video assignments. So, um, yeah, it's it's when cli a client wants both. Okay. And then, of course, you're on YouTube too. Uh, if they search for Ch Tim Gerard Barker, they'll find it. But it's Tim Gerard Barker 4886. Tim, I can't say thank you enough for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Wonderful to meet you. And I should mention... I found you through the wonderful folks at Wonderful Machine. Wonderful folks at Wonderful Machine. There's a redundant sentence. But the fine folks at Wonderful Machine uh, put us in contact. And so to everybody at Wonderful Machine, they have an amazing roster of people. Joe McNally. Uh, I've had a couple of guests on from them, actually, and yourself. If you were to des describe Wonderful Machine to people, how would you do that? Uh, I guess they're like a... Uh, yeah, they 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 are a marketing agency. Um, yeah, they market my work. They put my work in front of uh, clients. You know, I don't always know that I've got clients from them, but there are times where it definitely feels like you know a particular client might have found me from um, from finding me either directly on their website or through their marketing. Um, so I think it's a, a fairly good relationship. Um, they're also someone that I can go to if I want to get any help with a bid on a project as well. So, and you know, they, they help photographers with, um, portfolios if they want, uh, they offer a lot of services to photographers. So I find them very good to be with. And wonderfully nice people. And, and thank you to the people at Wonderful Machine for connecting us. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, again, Tim, thank you very, very much for doing this. Thanks for having me.
It was absolutely my pleasure. Links that we talk about, again, they're in the show notes. If you're watching on YouTube, they are down below the like and subscribe button in the description down there. I can't put the entire blog post there. There's a limit on characters on YouTube. But if you head to the website, again, it is behindtheshot.tv. Uh, you can find all the information there that, that, and again, just find this episode. One thing I started on recent episodes, and I'm going to try and keep going as best as I can. A lot of people that I know that are photographers or viewers or listeners of this show know that I'm a whiskey fan. So at the end of each show, just for fun, I'm going to do a whiskey pick for you. Excuse me. And this time around, I've got one that's a blend of over a hundred different batches of malt and grain whiskeys. And then after they blend it, they age it in used barrels for a few extra months. And what I'm picking this time around is Nika from the barrel. Uh, it's a Japanese whiskey. It is 102.8 proof, runs around $80 US. And if you're looking for something different, if you're a scotch drinker, it's not it's not scotch. Don't misunderstand me. But it's got kind of a, a you know, single malt type feel with a little bit of smokiness in it. It's actually a very, very nice whiskey. Thank you again to my guest, Ch Tim Gerard Barker. You can find him at his website. You can find all the links in the blog post. Make sure you join us next time as we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. Yeah.